and we will see. We'll refresh it here. And this is our with, with the class and on the right. And we will see that we have a mutant right here, and so we know which lines we have to cover. So I hope that all of you are a little bit uh, familiar with Java and, and, and unit testing. So, so, so we can um, create a unit test here. Oops, sorry for that. With and um, so if, if we create a lift with the parameter of 10, our top floor should be 10. And we can um, and we can assert that our top floor is actually 10. And um, with newer versions, we added uh, code completion. So we try to make coding in the browser a little bit, a little bit easier. So wh when we write this test, we will run it against uh, the original uh, code and then against our first mutant. And we will see that um, it compiled and it passed the original, original class. Um, so it you, so, so it um, ran through the original class, but failed for the mutant. So we detected the mutant, therefore we killed it. Okay. Um, um, so we, we could write a, a number of things, and, and I think it's the, the scale. So like I said, this is a, a team-based um, game. So we can have a lot of defenders and a lot of, uh, a lot of attackers all writing um, uh, mutants and tests at, at the same time. So if we, if we go back to, to our attacker, we, we can see that we now have coverage information on which code is actually covered um, and which isn't. So um, we can see, okay, for example, for, for, for the current floor, we haven't done anything. Um, like th 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 there's, there's no test, so we can add uh, a code here. And I'm gonna be really, really tricky here. Um, I'm gonna add, um, which I previously called an, an equivalent mutant, so I'm just gonna say, okay, I just want to have uh, as a tactical change, and I, d I don't really care about, um, about my defender, which in some, some sense is cheating, and I'm just going to um, create this. So uh, as a defender, I have a really, really hard time detecting Actually, I can't detect it. Um, but we have a mechanism for this um, to um, claim an equivalence dual. And um, for, for claiming an equivalence And the, the default value for the current floor is, is zero. We know, okay, the, the, the default uh, value is zero, so, so this part of the code should kill it. Take some time. This is actually on my local computer, that's why a little bit slow. Um, but it didn't. So our mutant survived a test. Um, but if we are really, really, really sure that we've done everything to, to cover a potential flaw in, in, in this, um, uh, in, in, our, in our mutant, we can uh, claim the equivalent dual. So, um, which says that every, every mutant in this line, um, we, we will trigger a dual, um, which, so th this will result out um, if we are an attacker. Um, and we refresh our page, we, we have a new um, screen which says uh, that, that, you, that the mutant that you created, and in particular this mutant, um, what was, was claimed by, 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 by a defender, and now we, ha we actually have to, to write a test to show that it isn't equivalent. But for, for this part, we can't write a test. We know that it's equivalent. So what we do is we accept. So you, you have either two choices, either write a test or accept it. Um, so we, we can do it, um, and we accept our equivalence, and then actually loop um, the, the, the dual. So at, at this point, we really have, have a mutant there, so we, um, I, I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to create a, a very, very tricky mutant for this one. Um, so in, in, in Java, if you add uh, two plus operators be behind a number, it will give you the value of, but then it will add one. 
So if we attack, again, no, um, uh, again, our, our mutant will survive. And for uh, as as a, as a defender, we can if we update our page. That is, there's no real time communication e as of yet. We're working on that. Um, there, there's another mutant, I, uh, and as a defender, I'm pretty sure that our our attacker that didn't um, didn't get <laughs> new new ideas, and we're just going to claim it again. <laughs> and so. Similar point here. No, no. Note that uh, at this point we know that it's not an equivalent mutant. Um, this is that we actually call our code twice. Um, so to the, the get the get current floor. And zero, and the for for the second, uh, it will be. Uh, with one, so I'm, I'm going to create two, two variables, um, um, and the other for get current floor again, and I actually ex should expect them to be equal. Okay. So we're now going to submit this in, in the hopes that we're actually running through on the original code, but fail on our test, uh, fail on our mutant, so we show that our mutant is actually not, not equivalent. Okay. So at, at this point, we show that our mutant is not equivalent, and we actually won, uh, we won the duel. And um, all of this interaction um, will actually give you points. So um, in, in Code Defenders, um, we have, we have uh, points for, for attacking and have points for defending, um, which we all result um, in, a, in, a score, uh, in, in the scoreboard. Um, so for each mutant that you, that you provide, you get one point. And for each test it survives, um, you get one point too. And as a defender, you get all the points um, a mutant has once it's okay, so this was uh, to just the uh, just the basic. So we actually use code defenders quite a bit in, in our course. Um, so we, we have a software testing course, which is two hours of lecture and one hour of, of exercise and two hours of lab sessions every single week. And we played code defenders with around 120 students, around um, three or four sessions. It depends on, on, on the size of our, on our, our computer room. So for the lab sessions, um, for the lab sessions, um, we, have mul we have around uh, two or, or three games uh, per session, one session per week per student, um, and uh, teams of around um, three, uh, three, to, uh, three to five students. And um, in, uh, at, at, at the f first time we applied this, each student only played one role, but it began to get quite boring quite quickly. But uh, not boring, but um, repetitive, let's just do like this. And so right now we, 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 sw we switch it up. And um, an interesting part for us is that, that we try to increase the difficulty of our course, um, or like or, or of, of the classes. So um, at, at the start, uh, we play with the lift class that I just presented to you. But later, we have much more complex classes, classes which um, with more complex data types. And playing in playing code defenders actually accounts to your grade, um, uh, which is uh, around uh, like. I think 10% um, of your grade, so we actually want to try hard and actually do do some useful stuff while playing. And for playing, we have around, we have four major challenges. And um, the the first major challenge is just the, the the whole classroom setting itself. You have to create a lot of accounts for a lot of students, and um, s students will come in late or will, will just randomly switch up sessions. So you, you have to react, you have to be able to react quite quickly for that. And um, we, we have an admin interface, um, which I will show, 
uh, a little later. Um, so, so, so you can uh, create games and assign latecomers and stuff like this. And another thing is uh, just um, man managing your games. Your games have to be balanced, otherwise um, people will get super frustrated or get bored. Um, so so what, what we do is um, we, we assign people by, by their score as a defender um, and try, try, to, try to make like uh, rank-based uh, matchmaking uh, in this. And another point is that people try to cheat. Like well, what I just did with creating an equivalent, this actually happens uh, quite often. And, but but th 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 this is the only thing that, that really people can cheat. Uh, another way would be um, trying to make like really, really complex mutants with reflection um, and stuff like this. So we um, try to restrict it um, to the point where um, it's not easy to, to write super complex mutants. So very good students still, still can do it. Um, and for, for, our other, uh, for our third challenge, um, for every single class, like I said before, we need to have uh, a new class um, under tests, which increasingly gets, um, gets more, more difficult, and at the same time doesn't have a lot of dependencies. So by now, uh, but by now we, we have the possibility to create, um, like for example, um, like to, to, to upload a class and then add super classes to that or subclass stuff like this. But um, currently you, you can't include your own libraries. So what we primarily do is um, use open source library, uh, open source classes, um, which usually are uh, data, data structures. And for, for, for the last step for, for students, the, the most important thing, um, we actually have to grade them. And gra gra grading uh, itself, um, you, you can't rely on, on the scoring system because of the, the, your, your score is heavily influenced by how good or bad your teammates are. If none of the, the opponents ever write a mutant and you write perfect tests, then you get, you get zero points for that. Or if you, if you have really, really talented um, teammates, th they will get all, all, the, all the points if they write excellent tests. So what we do is we execute, um, like well, well after the games, we execute every test against every mutant um, and then count on how many mutants you created which are most likely not equivalent and at least survive one test. So, um, and for, for uh, like we call them useful mutants and then we also count useful tests which are just mutants, uh, which are just tests which cover at least a single mutant. And um, what, what you can actually see is, uh, is, is the leaderboard of uh, games I actually used uh, to play in. And um, I've been in, in, in the game with, with the rank one guy, and he, he has a lot of defender score, like almost twice as much as, uh, as the second person. And that's actually because he created a lot of equivalences, and at that point, um, I didn't, re didn't realize how, how, um, how equivalences, um, like I, I didn't, want to, didn't want to mark every single mutant as equivalence when I wasn't 100% sure that's actually equivalent. I didn't want to ruin the game. And um, for, for the, the whole managing of, um, of, of, your, of your course, um, we have an extra uh, admin interface in which you can create, monitor games, and just assign, assign students. I, wish I will demonstrate this uh, qu quickly and then with just our two um, users. So you, you can stage a lot of games and then start them all at the same time and then just stop, stop them at the same time, which is quite convenient. In the, in the classroom. So I'm just gonna a short live demo again. <laughs> so we have, two, we have two different, uh, we, have, we have multiple admin views, but, but one of it, is um, for monitoring our current game. Yeah, um, the, the, this is the game that I just showed you and actually created the mutants for and, and the tests. Um, and I can not only ob observe it and look at every single mutant and every single test um, that, I've, that, I, that our uh, users have uh, created, but I can also stop them. So at this point I would just say, okay, enough. We, we, we have a new round of games. I will stop our game. So this gets on, 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 the, on the number of games and then we can create a game um, with exactly these users, and um, you, you, have, you have multiple options. You can um, uh, you, you can assign the, the, the role randomly, or just to the opposite role. 
use uh, in class. So once you have an attacker, at the next uh, game you will be a defender. Um, you can use your class on a chest for demo purposes. Um, I only have one at, at the moment, but you can upload as many as, um, as, many as you want. And, um, and usually we have <laughs> like uh, 40, 40, 40 people um, here um, which, which can play. So they're all, um, they're all assigned. So at that point, you can, you can stage it, which means you can um, still switch roles. And um, at, at this point, I'm, I'm going to uh, switch the role of a, of a defender, because defenders only defend, and def attackers will only attack. So, but but this, this scale is really nice. So uh, um, with 40 students, we have around uh, five or six games simultaneously. And then, then we can create them create the game and um, when I go now to when I now go to the uh, to the attacker view um, so this was, this was my d uh, demo attacker and I go to, to the home home page and know that um, I see that I'm now assigned in, in this game and as, a, as a now a, again as a de defender I can monitor my game I can observe it which means that I can look at every single mutant and every single test which has occurred um, we have a new view of the number of, of tests we have. So for, for, for every single, um, for constructors and, and for, for methods, you have, an, uh, you have an overview on how many uh, 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 tests there, there are created. We, we're trying to, to do this for, for, the, for the mutants too. Okay, this, this was it for the, for the admin interface. So in, in, our, in our course, um, we have a lot of students playing, and we all have, have a lot of mutants and a lot of tests. Um, so we get a lot of, a lot of data. And we have, either, uh, we, we have data per game, and we have data per student. And what we do is we, like, we, um, we not only try to grade our students, but we also um, conducted a, a study with, uh, with our data. And I will now present you a, a few, finding, a few findings um, that we have. Um, so one finding would be that <laughs> students definitely improve over time. The first games are usually terrible. People don't really know what they're doing. It's hard to, uh, for, for them to, to understand um, what's going on exactly. But you can see that students f continuously improve over time. And at the end, they are really, really good, like all of them. And, uh, and our, our second finding was that um, after we graded them, that the activity in the game doesn't really, like, a little bit with, with the with the action uh, grade, but not too much. So one one uh, one point zero is, is the best score uh, that, that you can get um, in, in in Germany. And um, th there are some people who write a lot of tests and a, lo and a lot of mutants. In, in this case, tests, but they don't really are re are effective. Um, so they didn't get um, a, a good score wi with it. Um, so you, when, 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 you pl when you play it, you need to have moderate quantity, but, uh, but at the same time have high quality of tests. And um, in, in, our survey, in our survey that, that we did, um, we found out that people um, th think that they learned something new as a defender, but not so much as an attacker. So what we try to do is uh, make people defend more. We actually have a new game mode planned, which is called the mini mode, in which people, which is like, deathmatch or free fall for, for, from other uh, games in, in which people can attack and defend at the same time, but we still have to find out um, how, how to balance um, all, all, the, all, these, all these things. Um, so uh, there are a lot of things that we can still do. And uh, w w one thing would definitely be um, to foster communication and in, in increase collaboration between players. And, and, and other things like um, trying to make the gameplay more, um, more interesting for, for people. We actually have an, another idea where like, um, you could bet um, on an equivalence duel with points. So if, if you create a really strong mutant, and then you can just uh, bet points on it and say, hey, this is, this, is re this is a really, really good mutant. And if, if, I, if I win that duel, I will get more, even more points. And um, we're constantly trying to, to update, to, to in include uh, new features. We actually have um, a s uh, kind of working uh, single player at the moment, 
but um, in, in which you, you, have, you have puzzles which you try to solve. So you don't play against other people, you basically play against the, the, the predefined puzzles. Um, but we still have to create a, a huge uh, collection of, of good puzzles. Okay, and then, um, another, yeah, so code defenders is publicly available. This is actually a, um, a screenshot, since I, d I don't have uh, internet, of the, of the code defenders instance that we have on, on code defenders, uh, code minus defenders.org. And it's absolutely uh, op open source. So if, if you want to try it, then do, do it. Um, if, if you have any questions, you can contact our chair. We usually try to give tech, tech support um, as, as good as possible, but um, yeah. Um, okay, so what are your takeaway take messages? It's so teaching software testing can be boring. Um, we try to gamify it. People actually get better and you can, you can uh, play it with your students. Okay, that was it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I was playing this with my students yesterday. Yeah. Okay. But I'm sure that there is a learning new perspective on, on where it might fit in terms of an online class. So if you anticipate. Yes. Oh, sh 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 should I just uh, repeat it? So, so um, the, the, the question was primarily that um, we're teaching basically security because we're teaching on, on how to think as a techie when you attack uh, a class and a little bit less um, on, like on, on defending and, and writing unit tests. Um, good, good question. Um, I haven't personally thought about it in, in this direction. I remember that um, when I played, uh, um, you, you uh, at some point I, d I definitely agree, but I don't have a perfect a answer for this. At, at, at the end, you, you're still writing uh, unit tests and, and do um, and, and apply some um, some knowledge from, from, from software testing, so like boundary testing, stuff like this. Okay, a, a follow-up question? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? If you don't have any questions right now, I will be s uh, still here after, so just ask me then. Okay, then, thank you very much. Okay. okay. I think. Okay, um, now the next presentation will be Vishnu. Showtime for you. As I introduced previously, the next presentation will be about the Formal Z uh, series game to help the students or to motivate the students uh, about formalization and formal verification.
Hello, everyone. So my name is Vishnu Prasad here, and I'm from uh, Utrecht University. It doesn't say there, but that's uh, where I'm from. Uh, so I'm here uh, to present some of the things that we do in this uh, uh, Erasmus Plus project called Impress. Uh, and this is the title, uh, adding a little bit fun in uh, teaching formal specification. Right. So let's um, start the presentation here with this statement, software engineers should uh, really write formal specifications. So at, at least that's what I believe. So I know that, that in practice, people do not do that. My students do not do that. Uh, and well, um, I, I'm trying to teach them, to encourage them to do this, but it's uh, also not that easy. Um, now some of the things that make this is not easy uh, is because, um, well, there is also some belief, you can say old belief that is circulating uh, in <coughs> A community of programmers, engineers, uh, even computer scientists, that writing formal specifications uh, require sophisticated mathematics. Well, it used to be in my days, at least. Yeah. So you you, you would need to produce a document like this uh, with very obscure notation. You need to uh, be able to write a little bit of LaTeX. And uh, this is just uh, pretty hard. I mean, it, not every programmer has a university degree. And if it is already hard to encourage um, our own university students to write this, then it's even harder to write uh, professional uh, programmers that do not uh, have university uh, training. But um, well, this is really in, uh, in the older days. Uh, maybe where uh, I start uh, at my university, but you probably also start around that time. Uh, but I don't think that's uh, still the case. So many programming languages nowadays, they are expressive, powerful enough that will allow you to write uh, specifications, at least to some degree. Maybe not all type of specifications, but languages like Java or C Sharp, they do come with uh, things like lambda expressions, which you can write function, nameless functions. So essentially, you can write things like the quantifiers. Uh, you can write pre and the post condition in this code fragment you can see here. Uh, this is where I call a certain method, so that will be my real program. And then there I can express the use of preconditions and post conditions, and this is being expressed here in natively in uh, in Java. Uh, things like quantifiers used to be a little bit problematic, and of course you can just write everything in Java. Is after all Turing complete, but it's not going to look very nice. And you do need quantifiers once you want to talk about. Um, more complex data structure. I mean, if you just want to talk about integers, then you do not need those, not really. But as soon as we need arrays or collections, then uh, typically you would need to have uh, quantifiers. But fortunately, now you can express those. Yeah, so the, the, the previous argument does not, uh, uh, does not hold anymore. Uh, but still, still, um, so let's go to the next slide. Still, it's, it's not easy to teach students to write formal specifications. Um, uh, this is a bit strange because uh, you just saw that you can write it in Java and all those students are good programmers, better than myself. Uh, they have background in logics, yeah, so you do have the ingredients, but somehow writing formal specification is just uh, well, a little bit more difficult, at least without some training, right? So this is the example of answers that you can get from students, from my students at least, when I ask, write a specification for 
a method like has common member given two arrays of integers, then this method is supposed to return a Boolean. It checks whether there's an intersection, uh, sorry, whether the intersection of the two arrays here is not empty. You can get answers like this uh, here, for example, where it's not even syntactically correct, uh, or it has something that is, oops, sorry, uh, pretty weird. Yeah, so here it says some expression and then the return value has to be either true or, or false. I mean, of course they are either true or false. Yeah, so with all this effort, uh, they end up writing something that is actually does not meaning anything. Yeah, so uh, they are actually in the right direction because this is a fragment that say that they try to say, oh, there exists two elements in the arrays A and B in which they are equal. So yeah, they are trying, really trying to say that uh, the intersection is not empty, but it does require a bit more effort to actually express that in the right way. Yeah? Um, so um, the thing is, when we try to make them uh, do exercises like this, because without doing this exercise, then they will be left untrained. And then when they go into the programs of programming, then they will always end up making this kind of mistakes. The uh, thing is that what has been pointed out by previous speakers is that uh, trying to explain this in the class, uh, trying to make them doing exercises is, is, is like this. Yeah? So uh, we need to have, well, not we need, but uh, let's say that, that we are here to try to come up with some innovative way uh, to uh, at least mitigate this. That, that can feel, they, they can feel a little bit more motivated. And uh, games have been uh, an idea that has been proposed for quite some time. You have seen Code Defender. Uh, this is another game that's called a programming contest game uh, from Microsoft. It's called PEX for C Sharp. Uh, and um, well, what we what we want now is not really a game to write a test like Code Defender or a game to write a program, but we want to have a different game that uh, can teach students to write pre and post condition. Now, uh, what we also decide to uh, to do in the project is we would like to experiment with. Uh, a different approach. So you can see here in, in the screenshot, this is PEX. Um, it's very, uh, um, it's very business-like. So it's, it's more right to the point. It's quite technical look. So because the subject is also technical, it's about writing program. So you get an interface that is very much in the sphere of um, writing program. Um, so we want to take a different approach that uh, by making a position that if you want to try to uh, eliminate the boredom, the boredom being boring here, so let's introduce some fun. And if you, have, you want to have some fun, then you really need to make space for this fun here. So we uh, decided to really introduce a game. So this is a game. Uh, it's uh, basically a tower defense game. So you might wonder why tower defense game. There are different genre of the games. Of games, uh, but there are also considerations to take here. Um, if you introduce an adventure game, then it will it may take days to uh, to complete. So maybe that's not a very good idea. So we need games that can be played short. And we also we need a game that people is quite familiar with uh, with the concept because this is definitely uh, ripping students away from the context. This is unlike PEX where you are still set up in the same environment, and this will take students away from the familiar context. So we need something that is somehow they can associate themselves with. And tower defense is known to be quite popular. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't claim that everyone knows that, but a lot of students know that. So we decide that's uh, the game here. Um, the idea here is 
Uh, here you have a short description of informal specification of uh, the program that is supposed to be built, supposed to be specified. Let's call it a min here, a program min taking two parameters, for example, X and Y, and then you have a, uh, a short description, a textual description. Uh, something like, uh, well, given two non-negative integers, then this program is supposed to return the smallest of the two, for example. And then the task is uh, for them to formalize the pre and the post condition of this program as formulas, though not directly as those. So everything needs to be cast in terms of uh, the game mechanic here. Now you see a lot of circles here. The red one here is uh, something, uh, well, it's a CPU. The entire game is, this is basically a print, uh, a plate uh, that you will see in the computer. Somewhere on that uh, plate here, there must be the CPU. The CPU represents uh, the program being specified here. And um, the blue lines here, there are two. One coming to the CPU, that represent the input to the program and one uh, coming out from the CPU that represents the output of the program. And what you see here that later on will traverse the, the input and the output, you can see data packages. Uh, you see the blue data packages, so are those, those are the good data packages. Uh, representing data that, that, that is good, that's uh, satisfying the intended precondition. Um, or if they, they are here at the output side, those will be uh, correct outputs, outputs that are produced by the program that satisfy its post condition. Now, um, we also deliberately make the, uh, the, the, the feel or the undertone of the game here a bit underground. And then we tell the student, you know, the theme here is that uh, there are hackers that are trying to uh, sabotage your program here and they are injecting uh, corrupted data packages so that's those are the rats that you see here so obviously the goal of the game here is to catch the red uh, bubbles the red data packages and you need to, to do that then you need a scanner here if the scanner is programmed correctly then all the red uh, data packages will be marked and then to introduce the fun element to the game, because I said this is a tower defense game, and here you see another pane here where you can buy uh, towers. You can put it along uh, the, uh, the, the, the inputs and the output lines here, and then they will shoot the, uh, the packages that have been marked. Yes? Um, so the the, the, the play element here, so the towers are actually optional. If a smart student manages to figure out what the pre and the post condition first time, then that's also fine. And you don't actually need this. Um, for students that like this as uh, something to play with, then they can actually play with uh, the towers. And uh, putting these towers actually also, well, it, it, it has a supportive role in the game in the sense that uh, you do not put anything and you do not get it right the first time, then your life will lose uh, faster than if you didn't, uh, than if you did put some towers into, into the game. All right. So now, um, let's see. Uh, another concept of the game is the idea of construct constructionism. <laughs> All right. So what, what I, I told you about scanner, so this is a, this is a scanner. Um, and th there is, we are, we are supposed to build this formula, the pre and the post conditions, so the formal specifications. So uh, what we uh, take the position in this game here is that, well, you know, you are not allowed to just type in the pre and the post condition, but we uh, slow down your process. We actually uh, require you to build, uh, well, a complete circuit representing the formula. So it's basically, if you know uh, a bit about uh, how expression is represented, this is the, the parse tree representing uh, the expression representing the formula. Uh, so they need to build this using different components. You can see here there are A and I, those are 
uh, variables, A in this case probably representing an array, I is also uh, well a variable representing some index, this is a box representing an array expression, the i's index of an array A, and there is, uh, well, you cannot see it very clearly here, but this is a for all quantifier. You can quantify over an array and indices, and this is an expression being quantified, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Now, um, the idea of taking this uh, um, um, work around, well not work around, but, but you are not uh, directly typing the formula, is that um, this refers to the idea of constructionist way of teaching. Uh, that says that, you know, um, uh, people learn better uh, if they can uh, operationalize what they, what they learn. They do not learn just by putting things directly in the mind but they construct the knowledge by associating every fragment with something that they know and they construct it in their mind. And that's something that we sort of try and are enforced to do here to the students. Uh, they need to actually break the block and then link it explicitly uh, using the construction box here. And in that way, uh, they explicitly construct the relation in their mind in slower pace. Now, there's a good thing and a bad thing here. If you are a good student, then this is going to be pretty uh, uh, annoying. But if you are on the slow side, then I think this is, uh, uh, this is nice to have because this can basically be uh, helpful to strengthen uh, the acquisition of knowledge. All right. Um, in terms of feedback, uh, there are two kind of feedbacks that the game provides. Uh, the first one is just the visual one. So remember that you have this, the, uh, well, the blue data packages, those are the good inputs or outputs, and you have the red ones, those are injected by a hacker. Um, and if you have a precondition there, uh, you have a scanner, a, a formula in the scanner, then basically, uh, Inputs or outputs satisfying the formula will be marked, as you can see uh, uh, in the top left example there. So that's an example of bad data being marked by a scanner. Now there are two things that can happen. If um, the scanner is over-specified, too strong, then um, it will actually mark data that is also good. That's also not, not good, right? Because then you prevent something that is actually good to reach the CPU or the other way around from leaving from the CPU. If the scanners, the formulas are underspecified, then you will end up not marking some of the red uh, data packages. So that's also not good. So just by looking at the color and the marking, students can get a feel whether uh, the specification that they build are too strong or uh, too weak. Uh, they also get um, more textual uh, feedback, so, so like this here. So this is basically a counter example. If the scanner is not the same, is not equivalent as the one that is uh, uh, provided by the teacher as the model solution, then uh, it will provide a counter example and then it will try to formulate it in the way that uh, um, um, encourage students to think. So for example, what if the X and the Y is both zero, but the return value of your program turns out to be minus one, for example. So then he thinks that, yeah, that's not really what the intention of the program here because it's supposed to return the smallest of the two but instead it returns something completely different. Uh, so that encourage uh, him or her to things and then uh, repair the corresponding scan. So there is also um, um, analytics back end, uh, thanks to the team from uh, UCM, Ivan. Uh, so we, we uh, 
hooky in, in analytics. Uh, and well, this is very nice because then, then uh, well, before you know that students play the game uh, in the classroom, but this gives you a global overview of what they are doing. So let me point some examples. So here, what you see here is uh, the recording of the formulas that they try to build, not just the final one, but as, uh, well, the intermediate ones. So that you can see, for example, oh, they are typing something like this. Is this making sense? Are they having a problem there? So then you, you, you can see, if you see more of the students typing in something that is uh, just nonsense, that you know that your class have a problem, that maybe you need to uh, intervene. Uh, so this is an uh, example of feedback that you can get in more details as a teacher, but you can also get uh, um, a more strategical feedback that is represented by the graph that you see of there. So here, for example, is the life, uh, the amount of life that is remaining uh, during the game. Uh, you can see that this is supposed to be okay, but if you see that many students start to have their life dropping very fast, then you see that the game is perhaps not very well balanced. It's too difficult. They are losing too quickly. Uh, this is the graph of towers that they built. Uh, this can be an indication in how much fun they have. If nobody is building tower, then maybe uh, the game is not the right, uh, well, the right tool for your class because nobody is trying to do uh, to have some fun. If uh, a lot of students are building many towers, then maybe the game is, uh, well, it, it, they are having too much fun. So maybe you also <coughs> need to, uh, to intervene there. All right. OK. Um, so the experience so far. Um, So we, we, we run this uh, in two incarnations of my course at Utrecht University. It's called Software Testing and Verification Course. Um, well, the amount of students uh, is about 80, so that's a bit smaller than the class in Passau, I think. Uh, the first time is uh, just an alpha testing of the game, so it doesn't really uh, represent much. We ask a group of students to try the game. Uh, the second year, we actually try to uh, integrate this into the teaching. Um, it's first time uh, for us, so we were a little bit more careful. And also, um, I think this is a different kind of game, uh, whereas in software engineering, you see a number of gamification already, but those tend to be the more serious kind of games. And for those, you can look in the literature to see experience from people. And for this genre of education game, there is very little. So um, we are not very sure how to integrate that. So we took a bit more careful approach by not making the, uh, doing the game here as a mandatory element. So it's an optional element. Um, so in the end from, uh, from 80, uh, so hold on. So we deploy five assignments with the game here in the increasing uh, complexity. Uh, but it, I think it's also useful to point out that the class is a fast moving class. It's a seven and a half EC course, uh, not only on software testing, but on software testing and verification. So they get half about software testing and the other half is about uh, logic, so you get OR logic and then they need to really prove the correctness of uh, a program using uh, programming logic. Uh, they get project, they, guess they get homework, and they also get this as an optional element because writing formal specification is one of the learning goal. Um, well, it, it is hard to balance. Uh, students are already overcrowded with, uh, with assignment and with project and exams. Um, so it's uh, not that easy. So in the end, uh, there were about 19 students that decided to try uh, the game. And I think that the overall feel is that they generally 
appreciate the concept. And they actually also learn something from that because the, the playing the game is quite revealing. You get the, the feedback immediately if you do not do it right. And then it's quite revealing for them that, all right, uh, so obviously a writing specification for even something simple and small is harder than they thought. And otherwise, if they submit a homework, then they do not get a feedback right away that it only several days or even the next week they get a feedback. And even then, then the feedback is only in terms of this is good or this is not good, right? And then the game will, uh, is able to be, well, it, it is more interactive and it can give them more incremental feedback. So they, 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 they learn. What they definitely do not like is uh, how we try to integrate this because, well, like I said, they already have a lot of activity. Um, so I guess that the hard lesson that we learn is that, you know, integrating a game into a class is, is really something that is, uh, requires some planning and some thought. It's not just because, oh, it's a game, then let's do that because it's fun. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's more than that. It's uh, basically require you, it, it may require you to uh, change the way that the uh, the course is given because then it's supposed to introduce some fun then we need to make time to let the students have that fun if that time is not given then it's not going to work and making time for them to have some fun means that we may have to sacrifice some of the learning goals as well at some other places so it's a bit difficult to uh, a consideration to make though uh, yesterday I had an opportunity to try this uh, at UCM here with a group of 10 students. And there, um, uh, the, uh, the setup is different. Well, student is not uh, being stressed by having to do this as part of a course, so there is not uh, really a mandatory go, and it's a dedicated one hour when you can take your time, you can explain to the student what the learning goal of the game and then you can help them and they have the time to actually focus uh, on doing the game. And it seems to work much better. Uh, they seem to appreciate it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I think that at least when I asked some of them, then they, they seem to uh, acknowledge that they do learn something from this. Um, going back to the pilot that we did, whether playing the game actually improve uh, the academic result, I think that the same statement as what you guys uh, observe, maybe there is some correlation. In our case, there are only 19 students, so it's not very uh, statistical significant. And from those, you can say that there is no correlation between what they do and uh, the, the, the final mark. But I guess that it, it depends on how do you want to deploy that. I mean, here, if, um, uh, we try to uh, engage students a bit more to make them more enthusiastic and then on the premise that if they are enthusiastic then they learn better then this might work although integration is something that uh, we need to think about um, another thing that we also learned during this experiment with impress is that um, this game as a proof of concept is is fine, but it is uh, you know it's, it's the engineering is is really not trivial. Uh, you have maintenance to worry about. Uh, y if if there are issues, then you need to fix those. And as you can see, uh, well, the graphics might be well. Uh, you might be impressed, but there are definitely commercial games out there that look much smoother than this one. Yeah. And, and I guess that students nowadays is a bit sensitive to how things look like. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, I think, interesting concepts uh, in, in the idea here. Uh, really the idea of uh, having uh, gamifications that put more emphasis in the fun, uh, trying to put, to create time to, to let students to have those fun uh, I think this is something that is worth uh, trying. Um, the, there are this kind of things that is, 
well, really not trivial. Not, not trivial. It's, it's those, this kind of things are uh, um, difficult for researchers or for TAs or for a team of students to, to establish or to maintain. So I guess in in long run, if we are really interested in uh, really want to uh, have this good gamification being integrated to, into a game, at least for this genre of game, then I would recommend to uh, work together with professionals in this case here. And, uh, balancing is also something that is very difficult. Okay, um, so let's uh, go to the um, uh, future work. Uh, yeah, we would like to continue our study, so we still have one year or almost, well, one year left in the project. And there is one more uh, run for the course, the same course, software testing and verification. So we can do one final study uh, for, the, uh, for the idea here, for this kind of game. And uh, something further in the future, so maybe we, uh, well, uh, can explore all the forms of the combinations of the fun, the, the fun way of doing gamification and in combination with constructionism. Uh, maybe it doesn't have to be in the form of tower defense game. Maybe it's something that is more artistic. So this is the uh, uh, painting of Mondrian. You can see there are, uh, it's consisting of uh, blocks. Uh, so maybe uh, we can use something like this to, well, uh, to do the gamification of, uh, well, uh, UML, uh, design, so learning how to model with UML. Okay, that uh, will be all for me. Thank you. <laughs> so if you have questions, then uh, I'm here. Yes, please. Uh, no, it was the expression here yeah. when I run a demo of this in a demo session for one hour with UCM University. So this is, you have dedicated time in your uh, for students learning the game. No, it's, uh, uh, it's intertwined. So I said that this is optional. And then I sort of encourage them to do those. And then you would have half of the classes doing something else. And then half of the class that is, well, trying to do the game. And then I'm, I'm there to help them or explain things about, uh, about the game. Yeah. So that's, no, that's, that's not ideal. Yeah. Because then when, when you see your neighbor, oh, they are doing a project. And then you sort of have a feel, OK, maybe I should switch to the project as well. Because I'm a bit behind in the project. So that's, yeah. Okay, thank you. For the last uh, of the presentations, then Rui Prada from INESC, he's going to give us a um, uh, presentation about of the supporting tools and modifications they are working on on Code Defenders, and, and also the Quest tool. Sorry.
this delay, I'm having issues with the internet connection. I want to sh do a live demo of the tool here for you. Okay, so today I bring two, two things for you. And there are two perspectives on gamification for, for the learning and teaching. The first one is how we can use quizzes as a way to present theoretical concepts, for example, and present some concrete tasks that students can do. And this may focus the way they study. The second one is about the use of storytelling, and in particular with artificial intelligence, to, uh, to, to progress, to give focus on the progression of, of the, the student as well. And in particular here, we are trying to integrate that with co-defenders, so it's more on the, the, the way we put together the practical level, and at the same time here we're dealing with uh, learning and, and teaching theory and learning and teaching the, the practical sense of the topic. So as a motivation, uh, quizzes can actually be quite good as motivation tools to capture the attention of the students in class, for example. Um, they also force participation because the students become active in, in answering these quizzes. Um, but also, in the, the other, another way we are exploring this is to support the students themselves in the study when they are alone uh, outside of the class to test their own knowledge and see what they know or that they don't really don't know. And uh, since if we want to use this and, and defend this as a practice, we also have a tool that reduces the effort of, of you as, as educators um, to set up this kind of, of, of practices in class. So there are two types of uses of the quizzes. One is in class. So in class, you can use that, for example, to introduce a new topic. I'm going to give you an example later. Or to just to capture the attention of the students in the beginning of, of the lecture. Or in the end of the lecture to summarize the topic that you're discussing, for example, okay? Uh, you can also use that to evaluate the students, of course. But if it's being used outside class, then the tool is more about for the student to review what you learned, also to assess the knowledge or the lack of knowledge they have on the topic, um, and can also be a tool for them to prepare for the evaluation or, or study the topics. And we want to highlight this a bit because this is the direction we are aiming in, in the tool, is that with this we actually promote the self-regulation of learning, okay? In a, in a, a bit of the flip, classroom uh, paradigm and to see as well if they can actually learn by uh, answering questions, learn more theoretical concepts. And the idea is that we put them just after they, they read or they get some um, information about the topic, make them work with that, answer questions immediately after or in their own time, but at least do and practice this discourse and this uh, question and answers as a tool to, to to motivate that. So I have to, these are my personal experience with, with using quizzes. They are not for software engineering, but when I taught the, the HCI, so Human Computer Interaction course, usually in the beginning of the lecture, I applied the quiz with the topics from the previous lecture. And this was interesting for them. First, for me to realize what are the gaps, so things they really didn't get from the from the previous lecture, so I could start the new lecture by actually reinforcing or clarify, cl clarifying uh, things, so I can build the new lecture on that. Uh, and they also realized that maybe they didn't really remember things and they didn't get things quite clear, so it was actually important for them as well. So it was kind of a way to capture attention and establish some common grounds that uh, I could work with them in, in class. In game design, I actually introduced this as a, uh, to raise the topic how much they don't know about the type of game. So the, the category of games and the, um, uh, what is a typical game gamer uh, in, in the market? Because if, uh, if you ask them, typically they say, oh, they are young people, they, they are male, and, and this is not right. So the, the average is about 35 years old and so on. So through a quiz, we can, show them that they don't know what they are talking about. And it's quite interesting. So I, we, we get to introduce the topic in a very interesting way, and I capture the attention because they realize, whoa, I'm wrong. <laughs> so 
So as a general idea, we pick up this on, on this project as a way to, to share the experience, our own experience, and uh, unfortunately to, to invite you to share your own experience with this as well, but create also content that you can use. We can reuse ourselves and we are reusing it, but we can share it and reuse among the, the community. Uh, in, in the goal of actually in learns, enhance the learning for the students, of course, in particular for them to be more self-aware of what they know or don't know. And of course, we want to reduce the effort on, on running all this. And that was uh, already highlighted in the previous presentations that running this can come with a burden. So we, we firstly tried to build something with Kahoot. I don't know if you know Kahoot. It's an interesting tool that you can run for creating some uh, quizzes. And the, the ones I did, actually, in the, the examples I did were run on Kahoot. And we, do, we did create something that you can check there. But I don't want to, to stress much on it because the philosophy of Kahoot is not really reusing stuff. It's just creating something that works for that moment and just forget about it. So you cannot reuse questions. So questions are not a first object in, in, in that sense. And they also have a very limited character. So the type of questions in the, that you can create are quite limited. Okay. And that's why, why we develop our own tool. And actually, it's open source, and I actually invite you to contribute if you want as well. So the tool has been already populated with lots of questions that we had from 10 years of experience in uh, teaching software architecture in the Institut Superior Technique, so University of Lisbon. Uh, so it has more than 600 questions and uh, more than 100 quizzes. And those are quizzes that come from the can actually show this, that were run in a um, so simple mini test, we call it mini test, that were run, run four or five times in, in, the, in the semester for the students to assess and actually for the teachers themselves to assess uh, how the, the, the education was going. And so we had that information and we just compile it and put it in the system. So it, it has already lots of things that you can work on, although the topics are quite focused on software architecture um, so you probably would need to build your own stuff. So what can you actually do in, in the system is shown here. So you have questions, that's the main uh, object here. So you can create new questions, check the questions that are there, edit it, change it, and you can use them in quizzes. Okay, they can be organized in topics. Uh, the idea is that the questions by themselves cannot be used, but you, you just put them in collections of quizzes and then the quizzes themselves are presented to the students. What we have here new, and I think this is something we're still working on, but we call it assessment. I'm not sure if it's the best name so far, but it's <coughs> this is a tool that we prepare a set of topics for the student, and then the student can generate their own quizzes uh, regarding those topics. Okay, so you can, at home, they can just reply to Random, uh, randomly generated, not necessarily, not totally random, but generated uh, quizzes for him to test uh, the knowledge and to help him um, study. We can import export things. We have a few things for students, although the, f the shared version is not that rich here because we are integrated that with the student management system at the university. So, I'm I will try to make a demo later on, but this is the, the, the view that you have on questions. You have a list of questions. You can edit the question, edit topics. And I just want to highlight something that we can compute and we, we're actually using a lot since we had data from the 10 years uh, before. So we, as we can check if this, the, the answers has, have been used in quizzes and actually been answered by students. And we can estimate the difficulty. In this case, means that it's kind of um, off, which means that half of the students fail in this question, and half of the students actually get it. Uh, the value of one is actually all of them fail, miss. So th this is measure the difficulty. And then we can set up quizzes, our list of things. Uh, you can see that actually th this has been entered by the students, so they actually been run. 
um, the assessments, you can create assessments. For that, you just create a set of topics that you want to be discussed in that assessment, and you get a list of uh, questions that are there. I hope to, to demo this later on. I just have this because I'm not sure if the internet is actually working well. So now I'm showing the, the, the view that the students can get. Okay. And the, t the demo, you can play the two roles, although in a installation in a university, you can separate the two and have your own uh, uh, login system, uh, authentication system on that. The, the version that you I'm going to share with you, it's free. Both students and teachers can actually have the two perspectives. But what I want to highlight here is you can create, these are the three assessments they are in the system, and you can generate quizzes that you can answer. Okay, and just get something like this. Oh, no, sorry, something like this. And then you can just reply and see the results. You can also see all the quizzes that were prepared specifically by the student and choose one to, to, to reply. Uh, and they can be open or closed for certain periods if you want to manage that. So they can always be there in the system or you can just give a deadline. And actually, one way to motivate the students is actually assign a deadline. So we have two weeks to answer these three or four quizzes. Okay, so the students can get this information. This is bad because this was me trying to play with it. I, I guess I don't know much about it, so get only 5% of correct answers. But uh, you have an overview of what you're doing. And we are currently testing this in the software architecture course, run my, my colleague. And it's a course, a uh, master course with 57 students. And what they do is they have through the semester, five different quizzes, and they are mandatory, okay? And they have five questions, and they are done in the end of the class. So they, it's, it, it's a lecture, explains the theory, and then in the end presents a quiz that the students need to answer about the two or three past lectures, okay? And the system can also generate the, the new questions for the students. So we do, I just want you to pay some attention here and in particular see, so this is the list of students, this is randomized for you, but we see that most of them, and this is live data, so this has been running now, the semester is still not over, and they actually perform, so the students' quizzes are the ones they generate by themselves. So it seems that it actually is working a lot. So they answer more quizzes that are actually self-generated by the system than the ones that are generated by the teacher. Okay, they, they still also perform the ones that are generated by the teacher. So that's why we think this is, is a way, a good way to motivate and to, to pursue the, the tool. We have some preliminary results, but I cannot really say this is, it's not necessarily significant. We cannot claim much about this, but we have data from the past 10 years and overall, I mean, they, they perform okay on the, on the tests, but we have, in the last year, 26% of ne negative scores. We kind of reduced this this year, but we cannot claim much. But say, okay, at least they are uh, using the quizzes, and maybe this has some effect, something they're going to study. And now let's see if I can run this. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. having a few issues. So you, you have these questions here. And for example, you can create a new question. Okay, good. And can be, well, uh, into architecture. And you can write something, say, well, well, is software first thing important? Okay, you just write the options here. Well, yes, and this is the correct one, and no, and so on, okay? I'm not really, you can save that, I'm not really going to do much, but this is a typical thing. So it's all the, these questions are always closed answers, so you can, it's the way that you get them automatically generated and graded. So you can create this, and then what you can do is generate quizzes with this. So these are actually the live quizzes, the quizzes that the 
Antonio, the, the, the guy that is teaching the creators for the students, they're all available for the students now. Uh, we can see a summary of that. So that's the thing they typically reply. So it's supposed to be a 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes exercise. We can edit one and you can search for new things here, like, I don't know, scenarios, whoops. And here you see the, the questions that are available and you get some information about this. So the difficulty, actually now they are changing, this is being changed at the moment, so they are changing the, um, the units, but this means that 80% of the students fail this one and it's actually somewhat reliable. You have 100 answers here and you can just, well, uh, you can still see that in a very clean way. You can check this, which is the correct one and you can add, add it to the quiz. Okay, and this is the, oh, oops, yeah. Now we have six questions on the quiz, and this always shows the list of things that you are available for you to reuse. Just search in, in um, and, and save. Okay. Um, so for the assessments, it's just adding sets of things. I can also edit this. Sets of topics, and then this show in the system, what are the questions that are actually available for those topics? If you, s you select a set of topics and you get zero results here, means you need to create new questions in the system. But here you just generate things like, I want my students to talk about software architecture, um, testing and so on. And then in the student's view, they'll have this. So they can see the available, uh, and they can actually answer one of them just randomly selecting this. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, yes. I managed to yeah, fail, yeah, get to right, not so bad. And then you can generate new ones, and this is what I think it's interesting for us. So let's generate a new quiz with 10 X questions regarding that topic. And this is self-driven uh, by the student. And well, I can just go this again. Well, it doesn't really matter that much. But let's end the quiz. And then I can see my stats. So in this version, it's, it's, it's session-based. So this is the thing I did. So I solved two quiz and actually have a better performance than before, <laughs> but so you get an idea what you're doing. Um, okay, so moving on. So you can, so I leave you with the link. You should go there, check, try to create your own questions, quizzes, see if you can use it and, and please share your experience with us. So it's, it's live, it's in the web project's website as well, but uh, this presentation will be shared. I think you can try to use it. Okay, this is one way to try to gamify the, the teaching ex experience, right? The other way is using storytelling uh, to, well, convey a story uh, and give some meaning to uh, the student's uh, action. So. First question you can ask uh, is why storytelling? Wh why is storytelling interesting for learning? And uh, the general uh, comment is that it's good to give a, a good flavor to the experience. In the particular, um, uh, the particular stronger point is you can give concrete meaning to actions that students are doing. That's why games like <laughs> co-defenders can work because you have, suddenly you are having some uh, some meaning, some goal, concrete goal that you're trying to achieve with a meaningful, um, uh, meaningful uh, objective. It does also support the flow of progression. So the story can actually tell you where to go and why you should go further in the experience. So you want to know more, you want to 
uh, eventually beat the, know who is the bad guy in the story or, or, or actually uh, kill him. It depends on, 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 on the storytelling. But this is a drive that keeps the players engaged. And the main, actually, the main point is that stories can actually um, improve the engagement of students with the task. Okay? The second question is really why artificial intelligence then? Because you can do that without the artificial intelligence. But if you want to support interactivity, and this is actually crucial in games, then you need some kind of way to ad adapt to the player's actions and options, right? And also you can use that, and this is one thing that we bring with our tools, the characters can actually be more believable in the emotional sense because they actually uh, react to the things the player are doing and not in a predefined way. So what we are doing now, it's uh, bringing to the co-defenders that we ju you, you just um, play with in a, minute, a few minutes ago. I think he, done, he didn't mention the puzzle uh, mode, right? Did you? Yeah, I did. You did, okay. So, so there's a puzzle mode, which means that it's, a s it's single player. So uh, a student can, s well, uh, at home or at least in class, play it alone. And we, we're picking up on that because it's, hard, it's easier to create, to convey a story with, with just one player character. Uh, and then the AI character in that game will be a narrator. So it's not really a character that's performing actions in the game. So it's not playing the game, but it's giving the flavor in the sense, narrating what's happening, telling what, uh, or, or telling or actually complaining with the player, so talking to the player. Uh, and he actually introduced me in missions to the player. So there's a set of, of challenges that the code defenders bring to the player. In the beginning, the character will just tell a story about why the player should do that. Who is attacking? Who is the guy that is actually creating mutations? And it can be like, a, uh, it was commented before, it can be a security uh, type of, uh, actually also of our suggestion is to have it a security kind of threat. So the player, uh, the, the AI here can have two different roles. First is to tell an um, episodic story in the sense in between these puzzles, tell a bit about the story. So tell, uh, introduce the new puzzle, what's going to happen and why. And he actually can use a double perspective. We are actually playing with it, so it can be an attacker. If you're the defender, you can actually take the role of the attacker and tell you something or are trying to mess up with you or, or, or the other way around. And we also have the opportunity to have within puzzles interaction with this kind of a macro narrative where here the character can comment on, on what the player is doing in the, in the level. For example, if it um, made a successful test or not, it failed to create a mutation, the character can interact and intervene and give either some motivation or, or, or try to, to engage the, 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 the drive for the player to continue. And we have integrated that with the tool. If you don't notice where it is, it's here. So we do have a text box where the character can actually talk to the player. So in, in introduce some sentences. And this is the way we feel that the, the storytelling um, is well integrated in the game. So we don't need much because most of the interaction should be here. We just want this to happen and we make sure that the players actually notice that, but that it's going to be a kind of a monologue. The player does not need to, to talk back, but should be aware of someone, there's an entity there is in telling part of the story and reacting to the things that the player is doing. Okay. How do we do that? Um, we have a tool that's been built for from previous projects, we change it a bit to, to, to become a web service to facilitate integration. And I don't, cannot go into much details about this, but uh, you, we can ask, you can ask me later, but it's, it's a complex cognitive architecture for agents where you have emotional appraisal, emotional decision making, knowledge um, basis, autobiographic memory, um, social importance um, rules and so on. What is most important, it is actually a toolkit where you have tools that you can edit the content. That's why we think it's, it's relevant for this because we have 
tools like this where you can add the text that the characters can say and a set of rules uh, how when the text is going to be triggered and sent to the code defenders. So we have a very light uh, integration, which is actually quite good for both uh, parts. <coughs> so we do have an, a HTTP connection between the two things. And the idea is that the code defenders show the character, so present the dialogue to the player, uh, and send the game state to this tool. And then all the reasoning and the decision on what to say and when is done in the Fatima server. Um, so we are on, on the process of creating the story for this, the technical integration is done, and we have exploring this flavor for the story, so this synopsis. So you are the player is a white hat hacker, and you know there's someone, a black unknown hacker is trying to um, yeah, break a system, in the, and you need to prevent that. So it goes along with the comment that was said before to the code defenders. It feels that this is the right narrative for the game. Then we can create some enigma here. For example, you want to find out who is the black uh, hacker as well, or prevent that your own identity is, is being uh, compromised. So we can play a bit with this, and it does not necessarily need to be related to uh, the actions in the game, but will keep the players trying to progress and go to the end of the puzzle which is what we want, okay? Um, okay, that's what I have for you now, so you can check the web page. I leave you these two links, especially the, the quizzes, demo that we want you to try out. And yeah, please, I'm open for questions, thank you. And send me an <laughs> email. Yeah. Uh, so the, the question was what was the front end technology that was used? Yeah. Because so it looks good. It, it depends the, the, the users might disagree a bit. Yeah. But we use the view and Viewtify for yeah. showing uh, to show the contents of a database. So everything is in the database and the queries are being yeah, displayed by the view. Although we are in phases of still working on, on the usability of that. So it's being run, it's being used by teachers and students. But it actually, the future work, I didn't talk much about the future work, is improving usability is one, and have more people using the, the tool is another, and actually create a, a compelling story and work with you to s choose the correct uh, set of, of puzzles that should be storified, let's say. So we want to do with you and then run some examples of code defenders, workshops with code defenders, with and without story, and see what could be the impact of that. Any more questions? So thank you, just try the tool, please, and let us know what you think. Okay, thank you. So um, this was just the last presentation of today's uh, seminar. I uh, want to thank you for participating in this, this seminar. I hope that you learn a lot and you for sure if you have any doubt, uh, please just contact me and I will just, if I can do, I can answer you directly, I will do. If not, then I redirect the email to the uh, specific uh, partner. Um, hopefully, if you also have any kind of idea of or want to use one of the tools that we have shown today, yes, please uh, uh, talk with us because we now we are mm, almost finishing the decision of the piloting for the for the project. So it will be nice to to have an external 
partner to to test uh, to test some of our tools. Um, that's it. I want also to thank you, the Madrid Network, for hosting us this uh, seminar. And have a nice evening, although a bit <laughs> cloudy and, and, and wet. <laughs>